So uh, thank you so much for joining me on The Same Drugs. I'm really excited to talk to you again. I love talking to you as always. I love talking to you too. And I love everything you do. You're so cool. And and like before I even knew you, well, I don't really know you. I mean, we're, we're, we're professionally knowing each other. And we did a podcast last year, but we've never met. But um, I started reading your articles, I don't know, like maybe three years ago three or four years ago, and I just said, wow, she's such a good writer and uh, has such interesting things to say. And I started retweeting you, and so I'm happy that you um, want to talk to me. Well, that's a very big compliment coming from you. <laughs> I have so much respect for your career. You're I didn't so realize. You say that to me lately, and I think it just means I'm old now because people say that to me, lately and I'm like, really? Because I'm like, I just... I'm always like trying to survive. And I know that sounds like privileged white lady trying to survive, but it's it's honestly true. Like I have a kid in college, I'm a single parent, I gotta pay for everything. And um, healthcare is expensive. And, and uh, you know, I live in New York City where everything is expensive and, and the journalism market just, just fell, the bottom of it fell out in 2008, 2009. The company that I had worked for, Condé Nast, suddenly told us we're not gonna pay you salaries anymore, you're all freelancers now. And um, I'm not saying that I have some tale of woe because I know that I have it so much better than most people and I, I, I know that life could be a whole lot worse, but it is true that I don't sit around thinking like, gee, I'm like, so successful because I'm always thinking like, how the fuck am I going to pay for my, well, the new thing is my physical therapy. Cause I fell on the street, broke my, uh, everything over here and had to, and I have all this PT and now the health insurance is only want to pay for part of it. And I still need PT. I can't, I still can't like go around like this. Like I'm stuck here. Oh I can't get physical therapy. It's so expensive. I mean, I haven't had coverage in a long time because I don't have a real job, but <laughs> I mean, I work for myself. So, I mean, I get it. Like, Aren't you Canadian by birth? Well, so like if you go to the doctor, that's free. But if you go to physiotherapy or massage therapy or like therapy Even therapy, none of that's covered. Even if it's from an accident? Cause uh, I mean, if it's from an accident and you can go to court and you can sort of coerce somebody to pay for it sometimes like icbc or wcb like if it's through work but often they'll dick you around right like they want to get out of paying as much as they can um so yeah, you can get here we like have this idea that canada is like this promised land for healthcare, but i guess everything comes with its challenges I mean, like the dentist isn't covered. I mean, it's don't get me wrong. It's great. We can go to the hospital for free, go to the doctor for free. That's good. But, you know, if you don't have coverage through work, your prescriptions aren't covered and basically everything else you have to pay out of pocket. And, yeah, I haven't had coverage in, in some time. So I paid for my own health care coverage for 20 something years. And it's so expensive. Anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to like be a Debbie Downer and like talk about my problems or anything. It's just, I thank you for the compliment. I, I appreciate <laughs> it. But like, I like honestly, I'm still. I had a book just come out like two weeks ago, and um, you know, it, it, it's it's like I'm so lucky to have a book come out, and I'm so happy that it did. But I'm trying to figure out what to do next because I can't just live on that. Like I got to do the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's still like that. It's still it's like a hustle. Yeah. And that's yeah. how it is for writers now because we're not like, you can't make money in journalism anymore. The, the young people who want to be journalists often say to me like, how do I do your career? Well, it doesn't exist anymore because they don't have con like contracts for contributing editors like they used to. And it's, it's yeah. really, and I don't know if they're telling them this in journalism school. I don't, I don't yeah. I don't think they are because there's a lot of kids who are still going to journalism school and I guess still think that they're going to have careers in journalism. And it seems to me like the way that people are making money now is by going independent. But that means you have to have had a career already. So, I mean, 
you might be in a good position to do that. But it's like people, you know, like Matt Taibbi. Like, 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 like I know some people yeah. who are doing that and, and that's like, they're doing great work. Like a, a few in particular of my friends are doing that and, and their sub stacks are great. But like you said, they had a big day before that and they just kind of took off. It's, it's, you know, it's not that you can't be a journalist. You can, but it's, you're not going to make a lot of money at it unless you're a very small percentage of people who just get very, very lucky. And that's yeah. kind of how it always was, but at least you could survive. At least you could um, survive. Like I remember at New York Magazine in the 90s, at one point I was making $50,000 a year and I was like, wow, I'm really doing great here. You know, like I thought I was just like so cool because I was making $50,000 a year. And then I found out that a lot of guys in the office were making 80. Uh. Yeah. And more, 80 and 100, and they were doing like the exact same thing I was doing. In fact, some of them, I don't want to say who, I was maybe even doing more, but they, they um, yeah, those kind of things really always were hard to find out. Yeah, but I mean, I get like the compliment to you about your career is because, I mean, you've done so much good and interesting work and you've interviewed so many cool people. And I only just realized when I was reading your book that you were the one that discovered that Jerry Seinfeld was dating a teenager. I did. That's a good claim to fame. Well, I, I mean, you didn't get paid for it. <laughs> I didn't discover. I didn't discover he was dating a teenager. I. Okay, so this is going back like ancient history. So what happened was that, um, yeah, it's in my new book. So I, it's hard to explain. So. I was, my book, by the way, is about my experience online dating, but then when I, thank you, but then when I started going back into my own, like, thinking, like, why am I doing all these things? Why am I putting up with this? Is it just the apps? Are the apps conditioning me? Yes, they are. It's social conditioning designed to make you act and behave in certain ways, but it's also like I was going back into my own history and thinking about, like, all the things that ever happened to me, and one of the worst relationships I ever had. I was very young in my twenties. I was dating this guy who was bad, a domestic abuser and he wasn't a good guy. And he worked for a, a tabloid. And uh, I was like, you know, just trying to survive in all kinds of ways. I was recently divorced. I recently left my husband. So um, this guy would get these like impossible, you know, impossible tasks to do, like bring me the broomstick of the wicked witch of the West kind of thing, which it was at the West. Yeah. And they would call him up. And so one of the things they called him up and they told him was like, Jerry Seinfeld is dating a teenager in New York city. Find out. And he's like, how am I going to find that out? And I was like, well, that's not, shouldn't really be that hard. I see kids walking around all the time. This is like 1992 or three. I don't remember exactly. It's 1992 or three. I was like, kids are walking around all the time. Like I see them all the time. Cause I had, I had jobs like dog walking and stuff on the Upper East Side. I would like dog walk for rich people and I had all kinds of jobs. I did. And every afternoon I would see all these kids in their uniforms going into Central Park to like hang out, make out, smoke pot, do whatever they were doing. And so I was like, I can find out. And I don't really. <laughs> I'll just ask them. I'll get the story for you. So I didn't really, I don't even really know. I can't even really tell you how I knew how to do it. But I was just like, I just like did that day what I have been doing now for 30 years since then, which is I just went up to some kids and I was like, hey, what's up with this thing? Jerry Seinfeld, you know anything about this? And they're like, oh yeah. And they told me everything. They went and got their yearbooks. They showed me. Joshana Lonstein, they're like telling me all of this stuff. So I was like, can I have one of those yearbooks? And they're like, for 200 bucks, you can. You know, <laughs> they were like rich kids and they aren't giving you nothing for free. So I was like, okay, I'll find $200 for you. So, um, so this tabloid that he worked for, I don't want to say which one, but anyway, uh, they would send him money like in rolls of money in FedEx packages and boxes so that he could pay off like doormen and oh. 
and 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 uh, you know the guys who worked at the doors of clubs and whatever. And so they sent him like a roll of like 200 bucks and I went and gave it to these kids. They gave me the yearbook. They told me everything. And then, yeah, so that was J Jerry Seinfeld was dating 17 year old Shoshana Lansing and every kid in New York knew it because every kid in New York is like connected. They're connected through this incredible network. This is when I first found out about it because they, they, they know each other from sports and, um, uh, you know, different kinds of things that kids do private schools, public schools, but they used to also know each other from hanging out on the street, which they don't really do as much, and in the park, which they don't really do as much anymore because now they're all like on their phone in their room. But there used to be a lot of really active social life among kids out and about in New York City. And I got, like I, I wasn't planning on this being my beat or anything, but I like unwittingly got tapped into this network right away through just helping that guy with that story. And that sort of became my beat later when, you know, other things would come up. I'd be like, I know how to do that. Yeah. I, different magazines that I worked for, New York Magazine in particular at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you've done so much cool and interesting work around girls, obviously, and then girls on social media. And of course, your new book is about dating apps. And so I want to know how long you have been using dating apps for. I don't, I don't use them anymore. I started using them in like 2014 to about 2017-ish, 16, 17. Okay. I haven't used them in a, in a while, but I still go on them. Like I have avatars, I have fake profiles. I don't, I don't ever engage anybody or talk to anybody or leave messages, but I just go on to see like what's going on to see, cause I cover this industry. So sort of, so I go on to see like, what are people acting like? What kind of profile pictures, what innovations have been made as the culture changed. And, you know, I don't think it's really changed that much since I was on them. Although there are a few things that are different, but it's, I think people are just more addicted, more exhausted, more more accepting of the unacceptable, really. Yes, I think, yeah, I think that like so much stuff has been normalized um, in our culture that is not normal and should not be normalized. I mean, in, in a myriad of ways from like, Pornography and things like dick pics and sending nudes and, you know, like obviously hooking up through dating apps with strangers and so on and so forth. And I want to get into a whole bunch of those things. But mm -hmm. like I, I, I do want to, when did, what year was it when you first started? I think you talked about the first you first what, used Match.com? Was that the first sort of, it well, wasn't an was, app then, that, that was, was a website. Before, I guess. That was before mobile dating. Yeah. It was, I started using Match.com in early 2000s. I had a baby, my daughter who just turned 21. And um, when she was like maybe two or something, you know, you get like the first two years, especially as a single mom are very intense, you know, like, I never left her side. I just, I worked at home. So I just, I remember I made a rule for myself. I will never leave her for more than four hours. Like four hours was my limit to be away from her. And I, um, I had friends and family and sometimes babysitters who would help me so that I could do that. So I was, it was very intense. I mean, taking care of a newborn infant is very intense. And I, I was still working. I mean, I wrote stories on, <laughs> Paris Hilton, Hugh Hefner, um, Damien Hirst was one of my favorite stories I ever did. You know, the, the great uh, British artist. But I was, you know, I had this little baby and I would carry her around in my little baby Bjorn and sometimes take her even on interviews. And I remember the New York Post page six once made fun of me for that because I was never like, I just wouldn't want to leave her. And they said that I was slinging her around like a Fendi bag at a at a party or something. Uh, that's like such a funny way that people that you look at that people and I don't I don't blame the New York Post. Like I love I actually kind of love the New York Post. But page six in those days could be very cruel and mean and and just kind of like they just kind of would like twist things. Page six would do that. 
under Richard Johnson. And they like to attack me for whatever reason. I don't know why, because I was just like minding my own business. But I guess I showed up at a party with my daughter and a baby Bjorn. And um, I think I was at the party to cover something, but like I didn't like to leave her. And also I, I, I probably didn't have a babysitter and I had to work. So I just was like, I'll just bring her. And I just, I thought it was gonna be like a low key kind of thing, but it wound up being like this crazy thing. So they said I was swinging her around like a Fendi bag. I mean, look at look at my <laughs> house, look at me. Like I, I've never owned a Fendi bag. Like I don't have <laughs> Fendi bags. And I would like to be able to afford Fendi bags, but I cannot. So um, they said I was slinging her around like a Fendi bag, but she was like in a baby Bjorn. So I was like, how was I slinging her? She was like, this. anyway, so, Around this time, when she got to be like two-ish, and she's going to uh, nursery school, I, you know, you get a little, you get your act together a little more, and you have a little more time for yourself. They have more regular hours, and I was thinking, God, am I ever going to go on a date again? Am I ever going to do whatever? So I did go on. I was like, I'll be that really, really pathetic person who goes on Match.com because in those days, and this is something that I kind of. Like this book, nothing personal. It's it's my own experience. It's it's um, it's uh, a lot of like thinking about how dating apps and dating online dating culture have changed us in in really kind of I think scary and troubling ways. But it's also like history, like I'm going into the history of how all this came about, wrapped into my own experience. So in those days, people who went on dating app. Uh, uh, online dating, there was no apps yet, were considered kind of losers. Like you couldn't meet somebody. You didn't know how to get anybody. And you, right. you know, that was me. Like, like you're I'm, socially awkward, something like that. Yeah, or just, yes, those was one thing. Or just old and not able to like figure out how to date someone in a fun way. You were just mm -hmm. like pathetic, a loser. So yeah, that was me. I was a pathetic loser. So I went on match.com and what I found was that already the, the, the foundation for all of the weird changes that started to change everything and become normalized to this day were beginning. Hookup culture was already in effect. It's just that straight people were not talking about it. It was not depicted in pop culture. Uh, it was not a spoken uh, thing that people were already just hooking up on these apps. And now I've talked to women who, who uh, I'm sorry, on these platforms, I've talked to women who were like, that was what they wanted and that was cool for them. But if you were looking for a relationship, like somebody to actually have as a boyfriend or whatever, it was really, to me at that point, really shocking to find that like, these guys just want to have sex. Like they just want to like come over to your house and have sex and like leave. And I had never, seen that before. I mean, of course there had been such a thing as a one night stand. I was not naive. I had done that too in the nineties when it was fun to do it. And it was my choice to do it. But this seemed to be like a really big cultural shift that was enabled by these platforms, but nobody was talking about it. Like you would have these movies that would come out about online dating and it would be a rom-com and everybody would always wind up falling in love. And it was like, that's not what it was like. They were already guys in 2002, 2003. I dated this lawyer uh like i was thinking like well gee you know i'm a single parent but like maybe i could get married to somebody and have a good relationship with that person and um you know maybe have some financial help too i mean i hate to go all jane austen about this but like that becomes a consideration when you're like need help financial help so i started dating this lawyer and he lived, I remember he lived in Park Slope and he had his own brownstone. That was like, ooh, good catch, you know, all this stuff. And it just became so clear that like, he just wanted sex. And 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 that was like, really? Because it really seemed like those kind of guys, even 10 years before, even like five to eight years before, would be more like they would date you. Seriously. I mean, he was dating me, but he was dating other people too. And I have in the book, do you remember that part where I, I I kept his emails because I thought that they were like indicative of this cultural shift. And he wrote me these, there was a lot more writing. They would do a lot more writing in those days. And they would be like, blah, blah, blah. And we were supposed to be like, you've got mail. You've got mail did so much damage. I know it's a very beloved movie, but it did so much damage to women's 
I think, ideas of what online dating really was. Because it was like, right. falling in love, and there's a rose. There's always going to be a rose involved, and a glass of rosé, and like, oh, my darling, let us talk about Jane Austen. And they were actually talking about Jane Austen. That and is the guy that you're going to meet is going to be like Tom Hanks, who is this like great, charming, smart, handsome guy who owns like a, a big bookstore chain. Right. And that <laughs> movie was actually like this celebration of of capitalistic takeover of small bookstores mm -hmm. which is, and the, like the decimation of small bookstores. It was it was really I love Nora Ephron. All I mean, yeah, and I love that movie. I've seen that movie. Well, I don't love like that movie. I think it did. Oh, it I love it. I want. I still watch it now. Over, like, if it's on TV or something, I'll watch it. It, it, it's cute, but it's brainwashing. You know, it's that kind of sexist brainwashing that tells us things that simply aren't true about, and also gets us to be, I think, okay with things that are not okay. You know. So anyway, I just um. Yeah, like so we you would email a lot. It wasn't like, hey, you up? It, it yeah. was like you would email a lot, and then you'd be like trying to impress each other with your use of the, the English language. Like we were, we were, our generation was much more into language and like fireworks and like showing each other how we could put words together. So we did all that, and then one point he sent me this email where he kind of said like, "Don't you know this is just like a pixelated singles bar? Like, what did you think this was? Like." And so that was like 2002 or three. So I got rid of him, but that was like 2002 or three. And then I didn't do any of that till 2014, I think. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing that, I mean, this is even, I mean, okay. So that was true then. I didn't, I really don't have a lot of experience with dating apps or dating websites because I hate them. But, um, you know, that was true then. Well, That's even, hateable. huh? Well, they're very hateable. Yeah, I mean, and I just, and I don't even, it's not even on principle. I do hate them on principle. I think they're really dangerous and terrible for society and bad for people's brains and everything. But like, I, I genuinely don't enjoy, like, I don't want to look at these screens. I don't want to swipe through faces. I don't want to go on dates with strangers. And terrible, terrible problems with rape and sexual assault. I had somebody say to me recently, um, you're raising all these issues about rape and sexual assault. And, and on dating apps, you know, because it's it's a very big problem. And and uh, across dating apps, there's no protection. There's no support for rape victims. There's no um, there's no vetting. You know, there's predators on there. Like we know all this now. There's data about it. There's studies about it. And this person said to me, "But I've never been raped or sexual assaulted on a dating app, so you know." It works for me, but that, see, to me, that's kind of like saying, you know, dating apps love to compare themselves to bars. I reject that comparison because I don't think it's like a bar at all. It's not, it's not the same. No, there's nothing like a bar. No, it's nothing like a bar because you don't have choice. The algorithms tell you who to talk to. But anyway, let's, let's just take their, let's just take their comparison for a second and, and say it's a bar. If you knew that there was a bar near you, that was really fun to hang out in and you could meet someone and maybe have sex with them or hope to have a relationship. But also a lot of rape happened in this bar. Like 30% of women who go to this bar say that they get raped in this bar, which is what it's more than 30% actually say, say that they have had sexual assault on dating apps via a pro publica survey. Would you be like, yeah, but I haven't been raped in that bar. I'll just go to that bar because I haven't been raped there. So I didn't get raped. So I don't really care that all these other people are getting raped in that bar because I don't get raped there. I mean, you would, you would be so outraged that the owners of this bar did nothing about the fact that people were getting sexually assaulted in their bar. You would want to know, like, what, what is going on in this bar? Okay. What, how, are these, how are the owners of this place not being held accountable for for this this terrible these terrible crimes that are happening here? Yeah, people just like if it doesn't happen to them, sometimes they think like, oh well, you know, it's not my problem. But I think these it is our all of our problem because it's not just that it's happening to these people; it's promoting a rape culture, wherein we all become sort of like 
you know, accepting of the fact that that's just what happens to some people who go in that bar. They just get raped. But that's not something I'm prepared to accept, you know? Well, yeah. So here's the thing. Um, these dating apps, we know, we know that most of the men on these apps just want sex. They just want to hook up. And we also know that most women on these apps want a relationship. Then on top of that, we also know that there's, it's dangerous for women. You know, there's lots of sexual assaults, lots of rape that happens. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that these guys are strangers. These are random guys. Like they're not friends of friends. <coughs> they're not people we know. I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold. So I have a bit of a cough. Oh. I can edit this part out though. <laughs> um, but um, I hope you feel better. Huh? I feel okay. It's just that if I talk too much, I start coughing. Um, but, you know, so what I want to know why women are using dating apps at all. Okay. Well, I'm just going to address a couple of things that you just said. So most women want relationships. Most men want sex. That is true and not true. Like t Tinder's, Tinder's own data says that most people – now, they don't break it down to men and women, but it says that most people, in fact, 80%, this is Tinder's own data, 80% of people do want a relationship. Hinge's own data say that most people want a relationship. I believe this data. I do. I do think that most people want love and connection. And that is exact, and that's men and women. You know, that is exactly why I think the apps are so insidious because they exploit people into, and, and manipulate us into behaviors that do not lead to lasting connections. And this is how it's done. Because, and this is why it's done, because the business model is engagement. They want to keep you using the app. I mean, it's a bad faith proposition to say, um, you know, come on our app and meet the love of your life, which is what they actually say in their advertisements. Now, there's some countries where their advertisement, these adver type of advertisements are not allowed because they're considered to be lies. Say, our, our science will get you the perfect match. It's not true, it's just, it's bullshit. It's just not true. What they want and how they're designed is to get you to engage with the app. They have, look, look at, look at what goes on in, in, in the office. You know, they need numbers. They need users. There's a lot of pressure on them from their investors to get more and more and more and more and more users. They have to get to a certain point. I think um, somebody in tech sales told me it's called the waterfall. It's when they when they feel like they they're going over the edge of the the the, the number that they need. I forget I forget the number. They have to get these numbers so that their investors are happy. And how do they get more and more and more and more numbers? of people using, 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 using. Just think about it. They're not thinking like, gee, I guess we should vet and make sure there's no predators or pedophiles or people with rape, uh, people with domestic violence or rape or, or, or sexual assault claims against them. Um, you know, because immediately that's gonna cut down numbers. And they don't have to do that also because of section 230, which as you know, is that aspect of internet law that says that they're not responsible for third party actions on their site. So they don't have to do that. So they're not going to basically do anything to keep people off the app at all, no matter what they do, including if they send dick pics or they send harassing messages or if they, you know, that's why you see these, um, you see these articles over and over again that say like, to, uh, this predator, this this rapist was on Tinder, and he never got kicked off, even though all these women reported him. And this this predator then went on Bumble, never got kicked off, because it's not in their interest. It's not in their business model to actually keep people from using them. In fact, they want more people to use them, and more people to use them, and more people because that's how they get to the waterfall, and that's how they eventually get to go public. Is they have more, 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 more users. And what do they do to those users to keep them on the app? Well, they get them addicted. And they get them addicted through, uh, you know, things that are ways that have been studied and, and meticulously designed to keep you addicted to, uh, you know, those apps and 
most social media. It's all these bells and whistles that happen. I did this, I talked about this in a film I did in 2018, Swiped, Hooking Up in the Digital Age. It's still on HBO and it, it, it's still on the HBO platform under documentaries and you can also see it on Amazon Prime. I get no money for that at all, but it's, you can watch it there for a couple of bucks. And at the 25 minute mark, you can watch the part where a social scientist at NYU, Adam Alter, who wrote a book called Irresistible about social media and addiction, goes into exactly how they get you addicted. And I also, I, I talked to Jonathan Bedeen who invented, a Tinder who invented the swipe, big, big deal invention in the history of social media. And he very, he very openly talks about how it's, yeah, it's based on the variable ratio schedule well, that's a social scientific, like it's a kind of a scientific experiment by this guy, like a scientific proposition, a social science proposition by this guy named B.F. Skinner, controversial psychologist who may turn pigeons into gambling, gamblers by giving them intermittent rewards for pecking for food. And when they didn't know when they would get the food, they would just keep pecking because it became fun to play the game and not swiping. So why do women still use them? Because women have brains, just like all people have brains. And whether you are a woman or a man, straight, gay, identify in other ways, no matter what your sexual orientation is, we all have brains and our brains all have dopamine in them or get, you know, shot out from our, I think, pituitary gland. And every, and that's our, that's our um, pleasure hormone. And every time you get a match, you know, it's a match. And you see the screen and you get this little rush. And Jonathan Bedeen in my film even talks about it's a rush. It's this rush. It's a nice little rush. Well, that's your brain getting addicted to matching. So why do women use these things? Because they're addicted like everybody else. And because, because everybody's addicted and because it's become this behavioral, like, conditioning thing that we're all using them now. Now there's this idea that there's no other way to date. Right. It's a corporate like invasion. Well, and I, at some point in the book, you're talking to a young woman and she, I think you're talking to a young woman and she's saying like, you know, people don't approach you in real life. Like they won't approach you. So you have to go on those dating apps. And I don't think that's true. Like I've always met people in real life and I've not had much trouble meeting people in real life. I mean, apart from the COVID situation, but I think that if we keep telling people and telling each other, oh, you can't meet people in real life anymore. You know, nobody will approach you. No one will talk to you. Then people get scared and they think, oh shit, I'm never gonna meet somebody. My only option is to go on dating apps. So everyone goes, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then any, everybody ends up on these I apps and they're not meeting people thousand. anyway because you're not getting relationships out of these things. I agree a thousand percent. To say there's no other way to date is like saying, I agree to forever be controlled, be mind controlled by corporations. Yes. Like that's insane. Of course there are other ways to date. We'll just leave your house. <laughs> just take back your power and talk to somebody, approach somebody. Now, there's a whole other element to this. If you're a straight woman, and, and I don't mean to exclude others' experience because um, the experience of everyone is really important to talk about. But this book is not just a critique of dating apps. It's also a critique of systemic how systemic misogyny affects dating that I only really started to understand later in life because we have agreed upon now that there is systemic misogyny. We know that it exists. We we have a language finally for it now. Thank God, because we can talk about something and agree that we have this problem. Okay. We have this systemic societal problem. But for so long, nobody, and still I think, nobody will really talk about how this relates to dating. Nobody, for some reason, nobody wants to talk about like how this affects the power dynamics in dating and and the like the choices that happen and the sex that happens. And and so what I'm trying to get at here is like, yes, you can definitely take back your power and talk to people in person and Studies say if you do, 
meet someone in person, especially if it's through mutual connections, you have a much better chance of having a long-term connection than if you go on a dating app. But my thing so became like, do I really want to though? Because what has this really gotten me? It's, it's, I mean, I got my beautiful- I mean, it's fun. And, and I love her. Well, it's fun until it's not, right? Like, it's fun <laughs> until it's not. Cynical. <laughs> it's fun. Well, I mean, as you know from reading the book, I had a lot of fun, but I also had a lot of heartbreak. I had sexual assault happen to me. I had um, infuriating, I had, I was domestically abused. I had infuriating relationships with two husbands where, uh, you know, the the balance of, of labor was not equal. And we've seen, you know, in the pandemic that this is still the case. Like relationships are not equal. Women are now set back decade, a decade, they're saying, a decade because they had to do everything during the pandemic for the kids, for the household, for, you know, and I interviewed people early on in pandemic. As soon as this thing started to happen, I was like, uh Oh, this is going to be really bad for women in relationships with men because the men are just going to be like, see you later. And the women are going to pick up the slack. And that's exactly what happened. Now I'm not saying every man, there's great men. I have my own, one of my own brothers. I have several brothers and one of them is a fantastic husband and father. And, and, and has a has an equal relationship with his wife, I would say, but I don't know that he's typical, a according to studies, data, what we've been reading, reports, you know, and that wasn't the case in my marriages. So, so, like you could say, like, oh well, it's fun, but it's fun till it's not fun. Yeah, I mean, I I've been in some pretty bad relationships. <laughs> Obviously, they've they've all ended because I'm not in them anymore. Um, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, what's fun is that, like, I mean, I first of all, I just genuinely enjoy meeting people and talking to people, which I'm sure you obviously do too. You know, otherwise you wouldn't be in the profession you're in. Um, I like talking to men. I like flirting with men, and you know, I like. I, I, I mean, I couldn't, e I couldn't even stop doing it if I wanted to, you know, I just sort of happened to, you know, you meet them, well, you, you hook up with them, you fall in love with them, and then boom, you're in a relationship, oops. Yeah, I mean, I hope <laughs> you find a good one. You know, I think, I think there's this, um, I do think there's a place, um, like Unicorn Island, where there's good men. It's like that place that Wonder Woman lives, but for men, and they make good men there, it's Unicorn Island, and they release like three a year, and they come out. They come out into the into the wilds of Manhattan and other places, and and you can find them and have relationships with them. But I think that unfortunately, there's so much going on right now that ruins them. Very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. It's porn. It's tech. I mean, the character in my book, who I call Abel, that I had a relationship with for for almost five years. When he first came to New York, he was very sweet. You know, he was almost like a case study in how someone changes. And I, when I first met him, I was like, I wonder how long this is gonna last, that he's so sweet and so real. And uh, he came from nowhere, you know, and he like never had internet. And then he comes here and you give a handsome young man in Manhattan a phone with Tinder in 2014 and in New York City where there's all these wonderful women, like so many cool, accomplished, gorgeous women in the city doing amazing things, weighted more towards single women than single men. And you give them this man, you know, this technology where he has endless options or seemingly endless options. Mm -hmm. And I talked to, um, for my film, a evolutionary biologist, a lot of, a lot of people like balk at the idea of evolutionary biology, which I get that, you know, it's not an exact science or anything, but I mean, we have evolved and, and there are certain things that we have evolved to do. We have to note that we evolved in a way that was like pair bonding. You know, we have, because it takes a long time to raise a 
human child. So the way that we've evolved was like to get together to raise the child, you know, for a certain amount of time. And uh, that's since like the agricultural revolution, which was 10, 15,000 years ago. And then Justin Garcia, who's a research director at Kinsey Institute told me like, yeah, this is this te technology, this internet and apps and stuff is like the biggest change in 10 or 15,000 years. We just don't realize it because it's like happening so fast and it's been normalized so fast, but like, suddenly whereas there was like communities of people that we had a certain number of choices even big cities like pre-apps you had communities within your city whether it was like your immigrant community or your church community or your synagogue community or your mosque community or your your professional community but now it's like everybody seemingly is available so that completely has upended our sense of like what is possible dating FOMO is very real so the effect that this has had on male psychology is really profound I think and I don't think that there's any denying that you know so it's not like you are having guys straight guys now say I really want to settle down and get married and have kids like that's not the most biggest goal to them now anymore. Does it yeah. That be? Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of men who just think like, oh, I might be missing out, I might be missing out. And I think like somewhere in the back of their minds, they do think, oh, I'll end up in a relationship someday. Like I'll get married someday. But they aren't behaving in a way where they're actually looking for a good relationship. Like they're sort of almost incapable of focusing on one person. They've all got their eye on somebody else or they're, you know, dating somebody. It's like, oh, but maybe I'm missing out. Oh, swipe, swipe, swipe. Like and this happens in marriages too. Like, you know, it's, it's upended even marriages that have been going on for 30, 40 years. You have people now talking to people, not necessarily in dating apps, although they're on there too, but like Facebook or Instagram or, you know, guys who've been married to the same person for 30 years are suddenly like, I wonder what's up with that girl I went to high school with. And, you know, that's happened to me. Like, guys reach out to me. I'll be like, did he get divorced? Like, what's going on? And then you say, no, he's not divorced at all. And here, I just want to pick up on something that uh, you just said. I mean, it's just destroyed trust, really. Yeah. Um, the genie's out of the bottle. I'm not saying, like, oh, you know, let's all stop using Facebook. That's not going to happen. But like, let's also be realistic and and truthful and real about what is happening. And don't don't pretend like this hasn't affected our culture and our minds and our society and how we behave in relationships. I mean, I really think that there needs to be a, a reckoning about all of this, so that people do behave more responsibly towards each other. And um, have more transparency about what's going on, you know? So, but, but what I just wanted to pick up on one thing you were saying about guys, like not acting like they want a relationship. It's not, okay. So this idea that you just said, which I think is very true, they're, they're like, oh, well that'll happen someday. And it's not just men that do that, it's, it's people. It's all people say, well, this is like a smorgasbord of choices right now. So I'm just gonna like, avail myself of all of these choices right now. And then one day I will become a person. I'll just decide and then I'll have a relationship as though okay. you can just be like, okay, I'm going to poof, have a relationship. <laughs> like, I'm going to find a person that I love as though it's that easy. You know what I mean? It's not only that, but you don't know how to have one. Right. You've never had one. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what it is. Yeah. Like, you don't know how to have a long-term relationship. So good luck to you. Right. Starting from when you're in like elementary school now and when, when like these baby relationships used to happen, middle school. I've talked to a lot of schools for my last book, American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers to kids about dating and sex and all this kind of stuff that, that has changed nudes and everything. And I'll say like how many people in this room have, you know, like teachers, principals look the other way. I just want to see a show of hands. How many people in this room? have ever sent or received a nude. And usually about half of the kids will raise their hand. That's about average. Like there's studies are all over the place on this. It's like 5%, 90%. 
I'd say it's about 50%. That's a lot. That's culture. But then I say, how many of you have ever, and they're, they're just kind of little like laugh, whatever. It's like, how many of you have ever held hands with someone? That you like? No one raises their hand typically. No one raises their hand. They've sent nudes and received nudes, but they've never like held hands. That's sad. Well, it goes to what we're talking about in terms of like trying to figure out how to become close to someone. How like to it's intimacy, intimacy, right? Like people don't know how to do intimacy because they've compartmental. I, I say people, but I really think this is primarily a male problem. Like they compartmentalize. It's like, okay, we're having sex. Like I've sexualized you. Like I want to fuck you. Like I'm turned on, but they don't. They, are, they don't really know how to translate that into an intimate relationship and build intimacy in other ways? Is that sort of like... Yeah, exactly. I mean, you just said it, exactly. And also, it's like this idea that everything is sexualized, that it's not about, like, making these baby steps towards finding out who someone really is. Did you happen to see... Now, I know this is maybe kind of a leap, but go with me here for a minute. Did you happen to see My Octopus Teacher? No, I didn't watch it because this is going to sound weird and it's not really important, but I, I have a hard time watching um, animal movies because they make me feel really emotional and I always cry and I just had this sense that this movie might upset me and make me cry because it might be moving, like the human-animal bond, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to feel too upset. That is so sweet. It makes me <laughs> cry so hard. I cry at everything. I'm so emotional. Yeah, I'm a big cry crier. I cried so hard. I'm going to cry just like telling you about this movie. Okay, so I was right. <laughs> but what it's about, it, it's an octopus. And she's not a big, she's a girl, a, a female octopus. She's not big. She's only like about this big. There's one point where she, he's holding her and she's just like right here and she's got her tentacles on his face. I can't even, I don't even want to talk about it. Takes, but look, just bear with me here. It takes a long time for him and her to really trust each other. It's all about intimacy. It's about how you build intimacy. It takes time. You have, yeah. to, you have to get to know her and she has to get to know him. And she's always like coming a little close and then like pew, scooting away. And they get closer and closer and closer. And it's, I would say, a love affair. It's about a love affair. It's about a beautiful, beautiful love affair that happens between two, two sentient beings. And, and I wish that like every kid would watch it and, and think about it when, especially boys, when they, not that women are octopuses or, or, or whoever you fall in love with is an octopus, but it's, it's about how to respect someone's boundaries. It's about how to um, care about someone check in on someone, find out how they are, um, think about them, think about what they need. All those things that kids are not learning, young people are are robbed of learning. See, see, I criticize the, you know, the male part in all this a lot because I do think that they need to be held accountable and responsible for the things that they're doing to women to hurt them. But I also think that they are being hurt by this culture too. And I think that the dating apps are really inculcating them into like the worst aspects of toxic masculinity, starting with sexualization. Well, men need companionship and intimacy just as all humans do. I mean, that's a human need. And, you know, like I had an ex who I think was legit addicted to dating apps. He couldn't stop using them when we were together. He was still using them. Um, and he was just, I mean, addicted, you know, all about this to like the validation and the swiping. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, he couldn't really fully commit to anybody, you know, he hadn't been in a real relationship in over a decade. And I think it had so, I mean, there, there's other issues, of course, that I'm not going to get too into because I don't want to share his personal information, but like, I mean, I kind of already am, but he's my ex, so too bad. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, he was so, like, he, I think he was being damaged by this, and he was that man who would say, oh, well, yeah, someday, you know, when I have kids and when I get married, and I'm like, well, you're in your 40s, like, when, 
are you gonna do this? Because you're just you're swiping and swiping and swiping. You know, octopuses, like octopi. When do you think you're gonna learn how to actually have a relationship? Yeah, and happen? build intimacy no. and trust with a person. When you can't build trust with a person when you're fucking swiping away on apps while you're dating them or in a relationship with them. Like that you're yeah. gonna you're gonna break trust over and over and over and over again. Like you this is this is hurting yeah, think, you. This is a big theme in relationships now. It's not just about dating apps, it's about like I was saying, it's about finding out that somebody's liking it somebody's pictures on Instagram or finding that uh, message that somebody sent to somebody on Facebook or finding mm -hmm. out that somebody is like retweeting a lot of somebody's tweets or, you know, I mean, there's like a million ways, the whole internet, there's a guy in my film, Nick Belton is a Vanity Fair writer and he says, uh, he's a tech writer. And he says, um, the whole internet is a dating room, right? I mean, this has been going on for a long time. And I watched it as a person who started dating in the 1970s. I watched it change men, change dating. Things were never perfect. I had terrible things happen to me all, all, all along. I, I think that I don't think that it's ever, you know. I now, like I said, we can talk about it. Systemic misogyny is real, and it's a like all those things that the the women's magazines were like. What are you doing wrong? Maybe if you just wore your hair different, got different a different bra, or or like you know, you know, douched. Is that what? Do, is Maybe that, if you were better at blowjobs. Right. Okay. Good. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. That's that's how this you do like, it. This is how you do. You know, a blowjob. Maybe if you just did these things, keep your man. How, keep your man. What are you doing wrong? You know they put it all on us and they put it all on us and made us think, in fact, when the internet first exploded in the 1990s, there was this wave of books. I talk about it in, in my new book. There was this wave of books that were all, one was called the rules. And it was all about like, these are the rules that you have to follow in order to keep your man and get him to marry you. And all of a sudden, this is in the 19 fucking nineties. And looking back, I realized, no, that is not what was going on. It wasn't us. It was them. And, I'm not, and, and it was the internet. It was technology. It was them. And it was technology. And I'm not saying that women are perfect or women are angels. You know, that's that kind of thing that like the right wing and the alt right like to do whenever feminists talk about this kind of stuff. They like to say, oh, so you're saying women are just perfect, huh? No, I'm not saying that. I am certainly not perfect. And I made every mistake you could possibly make, I'm sure. I've made lots of mistakes. <laughs> lots. But, but you have to look at the fact that we are trying, we as straight women, sorry, I'm straight, you know, trying to date men, that we as straight women are dating the guys who are in charge and make more money than us, even when we're doing the same or better work and who you know, get told that they're more important in every aspect of their lives all the time. So of course they bring that into dating. And and then on top of it, then they get this, wow, crazy new tool, the internet, where they can talk to all the women, or at least in their minds, they think they can. And it, it's important to change things. Yeah. They were not as interested, they were suddenly not as interested in dating you for real. I mean, like in some ways though, like this does kind of play into that evolutionary thing where, I mean, like in an extreme way where it's like men can like spread their seed without responsibility or consequence right, and, and women are still seeking partners. But, you know, these guys are like, oh, look what I can do. I can just, you know, not that they're thinking this, but I can just impregnate all of these women and pass on my genes and like, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, that's, that's like the, that's the thing evolutionary biologists say. I, by the way, I was just complimenting your hair. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you. sorry. I, I was talking I over you. Awesome. When you're doing that. We both have amazing hair. We it's very humid here. So this is what happens in humidity to my hair. It's so hot in my apartment. It's like 85 degrees outside and I didn't want to run my air conditioner because it would be too noisy. So what you say, I was just sorry for that aside where I was complimenting your hair, but what you say is absolutely true. 
And that is like a stereotype even about men. And I, but honest to God, I don't think it's necessarily what they want because all people in, in study after study after study, and there's this very famous study that followed men for like 40 years. And the ones who wound up the happiest, the healthiest, and this was like a lot of men. I think it happened in, in Britain. It's in my, it's referenced in my book, and I have like bibliography where there's you can see where the, all everything came from. Um, the happiest, healthiest men were the ones who had long-term relationships and families. And now that's not. I'm not trying to be all heteronormative and say like that's true. That's the best thing for everybody. It's not. I'm I'm quite happy myself actually, being single and being by myself but that has a lot to do with the fact that men often suck and make my life very very difficult and do things like hit me and put me down and and be competitive with me when it's really unnecessary and try and undermine me and like it's not just me folks it's like it's your daughter it's your sister it's your mom it's your grandma ask her she will tell you these things well i don't have to tell the people who watch your podcast because they already know probably and i'm preaching to the choir but um, this is the things I tell other people, like it's it's not, and I am not perfect, but we do live in this system whereby shit happens to us and I'm sick of being blamed for it. We've been blamed enough. Let's let them take some responsibility and let them know like you will actually be happier if you acknowledge and embrace the importance of relationships in your life whether it's with women, men, trans people, whoever, but you're going to be a happier guy, whoever you are, if you will start thinking about like sometime in your life, you're going to have to connect with somebody in a real way and have a real, real relationship with them and maybe even long-term. Yeah, I agree with you. And I agree that, you know, men should be accountable and responsible and that women shouldn't be blamed for everything. But I think that what I think will actually achieve this is again a fall on women's shoulders like it's like women opting out like to me it's like i it's like women know that these dating apps don't serve them like these are these apps are made by men for men you wrote this in your book um yeah. and you know they they know we know that these guys are looking just to have sex just to hook up and that the women are looking for relationships so to me i was like okay got it stop using these apps like go on a dating app strike like don't participate the guys aren't going to use these apps if women aren't on them the only reason they're on there is because they can get chicks so i feel like women should just well, opt out no. like it doesn't serve them well you're absolutely right but a couple things about that there are vastly more men than women on these apps the dating apps trick men into thinking that there are more women than there are because they use bots, they use fake profiles. I'm not saying there are no women on dating apps. There are a lot, there are millions, but proportionately and, 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 and statistically there are more men than women and the dating apps. This is another really awful thing that they do to men is they will do fake profiles and they will even do fake profiles of bots that will even talk to them. And this is something that was in a Reddit thread recently. It unfortunately came out after my book was already like to the printer, so I couldn't put it in, but it was fascinating. There was a Reddit thread, dating app employees talk about the worst things that happen at the apps. And they said, you know, anonymously. And one of the things they said was that they will, you know, have these profiles of beautiful women and they will match with guys and even have somebody engage in a few lines of dialogue with them like hey what's up what you doing you know and the guy's like <laughs> and so excited and then they they disappear and so their dopamine is going crazy so they and you know and they're like they're like they're like the prince holding cinderella's slipper and she's disappeared and this gets this is like a kind of also like a brainwashing thing. They're like, I can get a girl like that. I can get a woman like that on this app. If I just keep swiping and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. So they trick people. There aren't as many women as men. I think, I think women need to wake up to this. Like you said, I think more and more they are. And I would love to see a wholesale rejection of them. Absolutely. But again, look, 
I, I try not to judge anybody, you know? Like, why do people use these things, you say? Because they're lonely. Because This is what they're exploiting people about. I mean, think about, you know, one of the things I don't like that some women do, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but it's like, I'm so strong. I'm so smart. I don't make the mistakes all you stupid girls do. You know, mm -hmm. like, like, that's not fair because we all make stupid mistakes because we're in this impossible, like, situation where, like, sometimes any choice you make is going to be stupid. So use them or not use them, you know, like, I, I don't know. But all I can tell you is I do think that they are – exploiting people and their most vulnerable their need for love their need for connection their need for companionship just somebody to talk to i have a friend who recently got kicked off these apps and she is because a guy she told a guy to fuck off for basically sending her a dick pic or something and he reported her you know they, they'll kick off a woman for like telling a guy you're an asshole but they won't kick off a guy who's like a rapist or something it's like it's completely not uniform the way people get kicked off and she was so upset. And I was like, why are you upset to not be able to go on Tinder? <laughs> like, we hate Tinder. Like, for five years, like, all we talk about is how Tinder sucks. Like, why are you? And you tell me all these stories about these horrible things that happened to you on Tinder. Well, one, I think it was the addiction that she's maybe not even aware of. But two, it's also, it was COVID. We're alone. It was the only way to go on a date. It was like disaster capitalism. They were, they were capitalizing on this enforced uh, quarantine where people could only talk to each other in this one certain way. They were like adding video chat and all these ways to get even more addictive. And it had this seeming, it seemingly fills up your time with connections to people. But ultimately for most people, this is not leading to any kind of lasting thing. So I don't really, I don't really judge people who use them because I, I think it's a, kind of like a, a corporate pressure to be on them, you know? And I'm trying to raise awareness through my book, you know, trying to say things about it. Other people try and say things about it, but like, don't, don't judge them too harshly for just doing what they think is going to, they maybe don't know all this and they think they're just doing what they think is going to get them love and what, well, yeah. And I mean, so dating apps have been so normalized that, you know, people do really believe this is what everyone's doing and this is how everyone's meeting people. And it kind of does seem like it's what everyone is doing. Like when I was single in Vancouver during COVID, all of my friends were like pressured, like go on dating apps, go on dating apps. We're all on dating apps. Everyone's on dating apps. And I was like, I don't want, I'll just be fucking single. Honestly, these things just make me feel worse. I hate them. Like, I don't like, I don't want to do this with my time. I don't want to spend more time looking at a screen. I'm never going to go out on a date with, I just know my, like, I'm not going to go on a date with a stranger. I'm not going to spend my time messaging with a stranger. This isn't how I connect with people. And every once in a while, I'd just be like, oh, I'll just go look. So I'd like download one and go on one for like an hour and then be like, no, this is not for me. I'm going off it. But it's it, it's normalized and people are pressured into using them, and like, I would also they prey upon people who have, you know, like maybe are lonely or sad. Like when I went yeah. on them, it was, um, and a lot of people in our culture are lonely and sad. You know, studies bear out, and and like there's a lot about things about our culture that are very alienating, and make people feel very lonely, and and there's studies on this too i mean i hate keep i hate to keep referencing studies but like this isn't just me saying it you know i did a lot of research for this book and we have a problem with loneliness and dating apps are only making people lonelier isn't that ironic so when i started using them i had had my heart broken it was a really difficult period you know where i was like starting to go through menopause and i was you know heartbroken and and a lot of financial pressures and a lot of things were happening that were not, um, it wasn't an easy time for me. And I was upset and a friend of mine, younger guy said, why don't you just go fuck somebody on Tinder? Like, it's really easy. Just go fuck somebody on Tinder, get it out of your system or go fuck somebody on a dating app. I think he said. So, I went on, as I think I'm not the only person this has ever happened to, I went on like at a very vulnerable uh, moment. You know, I didn't go on there thinking like, 
I'm going to meet the love of my life and ride off into the sunset and get married. First of all, I never want to be married again, ever. And, and it's just not for me. I don't think, I don't think I'm a woman who can accept the inequity in heterosexual relationships that much anymore. I, I tried it twice. It just didn't work for me. But not only that, I just, um, I, I think, you know, as a writer, as a, as a woman who, you know, has, has to do a kind of work where you might start at 10 o'clock at night and go till four in the morning and nobody can bother you or talk to you. You just got to do that. And, and like being in a relationship with a straight man very often, and I'm not saying all straight guys are like this, but they're very, like, what are you doing? Why don't you come to bed? Like, yeah. what are you they get very upset. A lot of them that you're not focusing on them and paying attention to them. And, you know, and then they will like retaliate doing some weird thing like that. Like I was just trying to make a living. <laughs> like that yeah. really happened to me. I had to do this cover story on, I know this sounds like, I know how this sounds. I promise you I know how this sounds, but this is the truth. I had to do a cover story about Angelina Jolie. So I went to, I didn't want to, we had this tiny little apartment. I didn't want to wake up my husband and my daughter and his son who lived with us a lot of the time because I was like up and I had to be this tiny little apartment. Not this one, it was a different one. So I went to a friend's house to because she's like sleeps like, the dead and I just like did my story at her house because she's a bigger apartment so I could be like and I came home at like six in the morning and he's like making breakfast he's like for the kids he's like all mad he thought I had been out fucking somebody I was like I, I look at me like do I look like I was out on a date like you know how you get when you write all night like I was like greasy and like I had this big big bag full of like you know, tapes back then we still use tapes and like my tape recorder to listen to what she was saying. And like, I was like, I was writing the cover story to Angelina Jolie. He was like so convinced that I had been fucking somebody. And it was just like absurd. It was insane. So I don't know why I told that story. And he was mad at me for days and like, didn't believe me and all, all this craziness because, well, Oh, I know why. Because like, I never want to get married again. I never want to deal with that kind of stuff again, ever. Like that's been my lot and I don't ever want to deal with that again. But I think like, you know, I wanted to have distraction, fun, companionship, you know, whatever it would bring to not think about my heartache. And I think a lot of people do use dating apps when they are heartbroken. Like it's a rebound thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To distract themselves. So you don't sadness. have to feel the feelings. Yeah. Right? But then you wind up getting all these other more horrible feelings and you get sucked in by the addiction and you feel like you're not, things aren't as bad as you thought they were because, Oh, look, all these people are matching with me. Well, some of them might be bots. You don't even know, but they're matching with me and they're telling me like they want to have sex with me and all this stuff. And it's all just like a bullshit game, but it, it, fills up some void of of like sadness and loneliness that you have and i don't think i'm the only person that that happens to i just no, write, like truthfully yeah i mean i've had girlfriends say to me like oh just go on it like it'll make you feel good you get all this attention and i was mm -hmm. like really like i was like i don't need that kind of validation a i have a very robust ego like i like myself so i don't really need like, there's, I don't need attention from strangers, like people who have no idea who I am, who are like, they like you, I want to fuck you. Like, it doesn't make me feel good because it's fake. That's not real. You don't know me. You don't know if you want me. Like, I don't, I don't care about you. You don't care about me. Like, I want to meet somebody who likes me, who knows me. You know? Absolutely right. And I love what you're teaching right now. I love the, the, the self-love that you're teaching. But again, we mustn't judge people who do this because we're not better or worse because we used a dating app. I mean, millions and millions and millions and millions of people all over the world use, da use dating apps. And um, it doesn't make them weak or, or dumb. It just makes them engaging in this culture. And for a lot of young people, there's, they don't know anything else. Like this is what they've been told is the way to do this from the time they're, and your, your self-esteem is, is so palpable and, 
important. And and I think that, and I and I want you to give that to people, but at the same time, we don't judge and compare, right? Like we don't say to people like who might be feeling low or might be feeling bad or have been using these things, like, you're just dumb. Just don't do it. You know, like right. it's somehow not that easy some for, sometimes for some people. Like yeah, I'm not on them anymore and I'm so much happier for not being on them anymore. But it's not that I'm a better person now. It's that I got through something that I was going through. That was yeah. hard. And yeah. my, it's not that I don't understand or that I think that they're stupid. It's that I think they're misguided. Like I think they're being told that they'll find something or that this is a good way to find something. And they believe it just as most people do. And they don't. Like what I'm trying to say is, you guys, this is not going to get you what you want. Like I get why they're there and I get what they're looking for and I get what they're getting out of it or what they think they're getting out of it. Well, you and, know, some people claim that they have wonderful experiences. Like I would like to know if, you know, that was true across the board because, I mean, the statistics are so astronomical about dick pics and harassing messages and all that kind of stuff. So I, I mean, like if people will say like, well, I just had a wonderful time. I met my husband and he's fantastic. And we had this perfect wedding. And do you want to see the pictures? They're all on Instagram. And you know, like some people will, will tell you that stuff. Like, well, I don't know what your problem was. Perhaps you were using them wrong, you know, because my life is just, you know, we live in this kind of like Instagram culture where everyone wants to compare pictures of their life and say that like my life is just so much better than yours and you must have been doing something wrong. But, you know, I'm so happy for those people. Like if you actually did use this technological tool and find wondrous love and, and happily ever after out of it, that's fantastic. But the statistics say that most the data that we do have, and there's not a lot of data because data apps, uh, isn't this kind of funny? Don't really like to give out data on marriages and lasting relationships. They don't. You can't get it. Only Pew has it. Pew, Pew's Pew Research Center is the most reliable data that we have. It says 12% of Americans overall have found marriage or lasting relationships, and they don't even break it down to what which is which. And 39% of dating app, regular dating app users. But 39% sounds like, well, that's pretty good. 39%, right? That's not good at all. That's like, if there was a COVID shot that was 39% efficacy, would you would you think you were not gonna get COVID if you took it? I mean, it's, it's not good. And again, we don't know if those relationships were like two months or two years or, or, or you know, they've, these things have only been around for so long. And like, I'm also trying to say, they interfere with the relationship. Once you have it, like the beginning of the relationship is is not the end of everything. Like once you have it and you get a dip in your sex life or you have a fight or whatever, it's like that itch, 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 itch in your addictive brain, like just like cigarettes. Like when I get stressed out, I don't smoke anymore. I haven't for uh, two decades. But still to this day, it's like heroin addiction or something. If I get really super stressed out and some crazy stuff is happening, I want a cigarette. So when you're in that relationship, when you get addicted to this stuff, when you're in a relationship or whatever and stuff starts to happen, you could want to go back on it or you could start looking for people online in other ways. So I'm just saying, like, I, I know what you're saying. I totally understand what you're saying. Like, just don't use it. I agree. But I don't think it's that simple because it's like everywhere. It's like everywhere and it's like everything. And it's not just Tinder. It's also, yeah, like these guys, I was interviewing these guys. I, I had to do it, like a story for a little thing on like sexy summer. Like there's going to be like, you know, because COVID's like getting to be more manageable. Um, and everyone's saying this is going to be like hot girl summer, not my phrase. And so I had to interview these young guys. Like about everybody's going to like go crazy and hook up with. They're already family. doing it. It's already happening in New York. Oh I, yeah, I've like, I've witnessed it. I've yes. been there. <laughs> I went out like just even like the lines of people were so crazy at all the bars and like I've never seen New York like this. 
like in the last three days. It's been like a complete. I mean, people have been deprived of physical touch. It's like you just, it's like somebody touch my body. <laughs> right. So I'm like, so talking to people about it and like, cause I have to do this little thing on it. And technology is still a factor. It's so crazy. Like you guys just got let out of quarantine. But these guys were telling me, I was like, well, what are you going to do? Do you, you go up to girls and talk to them? They're like, yeah, I do that. But more so, like, I'll just hit them up on Instagram. Like, Gen Z is not about dating apps. They're about, like, Instagram. That's what they're telling me. Like, they they just, I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, you know, I'll just ask for her Instagram. And then I'll, like, see her pictures. And then I'll, like, send her a DM. Rather than have a real conversation. So, I don't know. What is the answer? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, so, and I, I, I wanted to get back to the the porn connection just because I found some of the 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 points that you made and the things that you discovered in your research around the connection between porn and dating apps really interesting. Um, and one of those things was that, I mean, well, there was one of those things where the guy who is credited with inventing online dating was also very invested in online porn. Yep. Um, same person. Yeah. And like, and then the fact that you, you wrote about how men will go, you know, back and forth between porn and the dating app. So they'll look at porn and they'll get turned on and then they'll go on the dating app to try to find a girl to hook up with. Or they'll be like watching porn while they're sexting women on the apps. Yeah, like, yeah. This is something that um, has been described to me by a lot of guys. And, you know, I I don't want to say women are naive or anything. Like, it's not, it's not what I'm saying. But I don't know that women, straight women who deal with straight men, are always so aware of what they're doing when they're on a dating app with you. How? They, they describe to me what it's like to be, what they do when they're on a dating app. First of all, they're not talking to one person. And, and I'm not saying only men do this. Women do it too. They might be talking to multiple people. They might be copy pasting messages. They might be watching porn at the same time. This is all the dehumanization. Like nobody's special, right? They might be watching porn at the same time, getting excited about porn, getting excited about the idea of you producing some self-generated porn for them in the form of nudes because they're watching porn. And what's even more exciting than watching like online porn is seeing the porn of a woman who is actually there at their disposal to put on this like porn show for them right then. So. I don't think that they, and they watch porn on their phone too, in the same place where they are talking to you on a dating app. So I don't think that they really separate a lot of them in their mind, the difference between porn and nudes and dating. It's like, it's a kind of, because then they might ask you to do something like go from the dating app to FaceTime and take your top off or send me a pic or, you know, you know what I mean? So like, I think that the, they talk about going in between these activities, porn watching and dating. Let's just think, and, about, let's just, let's just think about it for a second. Dating used to be something like a hundred years ago and I'm not glamorizing or rom romanticizing the past, but it was something that happened like in the parlor. I talked to this really great dating historian named Maura Weigel. She wrote a book called Labor of Love. And um, she talks about, to me, in, in my film, and it's in this book too, about how dating kind of started and how it all evolved, like, as an activity. Once upon a time, people tended to have people introduced to them by their parents, their community, by their community leaders, and they would come to your house and you would literally sit in the parlor or if you didn't have a parlor, like on the porch and your parents were sort of there watching. I'm not romanticizing this. I'm just saying like, it was something that happened under the watchful eye of parents or communities, whatever. Then we evolved to like their cities and, and you know, women start moving from the countryside into big cities and 
get going to work in cities and factories and stuff. And that's really when dating started. Women really created dating. And, and it was because they were liberating themselves through like getting jobs and having more sexual autonomy and stuff. Of course, as soon as this happened in America, they started arresting them. Like that's in my book too. Like there was this whole government program to arrest women for dating, for looking like they were like promiscuous because they were like dating or, you know, you read about it in the book. This Any is the American plan. The American yeah. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, actually. I had not heard about this. the 1970s. Like, who has even heard of it? There's this really great book about it. Yes, it was this government program that was sort of in reaction to women dating. And they're like, say, is she sleeping with too many men? Let us arrest her and put her in, like, a reformatory because she actually was, like, going on dates with men. You know, the authorities were very upset about all this. So, so, um... But then, you know, by the time I'm a, a girl and I'm starting to date and everything, there were like certain times you would date. Dating wasn't all the time like it is now. Dating is sort of all the time now because it's on Instagram. It's on, you know, you might get hit up a DM, whatever, you know. I don't know. It's just like it's constant. And dating apps are sort of constant. And people look at them first thing in the morning when they open their eyes because like their brains are conditioned to do that. And it happens when you're not in the same room. So the person on the other end of the date, which isn't even really a date anymore, could be doing anything, jerking off. A lot of guys tell me that they jerk off while they're on the dating app. They're just trying to find release like they do in porn. Like they watch a porn movie and they want to have release and they they talk, start talking to some woman and try and get her into some like sexual conversation because they want to jerk off to that. Or they want to jerk off to her sending a nude or they want to jerk off to her like taking her top off or show show me this or show me that it's like objectification you know but i mean i guess can you explain like i mean it might seem obvious but can you explain why that's a bad thing because i think a lot of people um will watch men especially and they'll say well like i mean but women too honestly women have normal like young women have really normalized porn use like young women i think just expect their boyfriends or the guys they're dating to be using porn they they are just like oh yeah everybody uses porn because these guys that they're dating have all grown up with internet porn it's just all around all the time it's on their phones all the time it's unavoidable which is not the case in my generation or, you know, like I grew up without the internet. So of course there was pornography, but it was like magazines um, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager. Um, but like, you know, I think guys, guys don't understand what's wrong with porn. Uh, they'll just say, you know, like, okay, <laughs> like, yeah, I use porn. Yeah, I use dating apps. Like, so what? I like looking at chicks. Like, I like masturbating. Like, it turns me on. Like, what's the big deal? Well, I think that it's two different things, right? But they've been merged into one. Like, if you want to watch porn, watch porn. If you if you want to watch porn and jerk off to porn, do that. But I think it's very different when you go on this platform that's ostensibly supposed to be about getting to know someone and dating them and but that's not what you're doing. You're engaging in this kind of objectification where you're really just treating them as an object that you can jerk off to as if they were porn. And so I don't think it's the same as the point I was trying to make with like the parlor and like, like going to out to have dinner and like talking and whatever. It's just not the same. It's like porn consumption and treating dating as Porn, as you would porn consumption. And I think they're two very different activities with, with different goals, you know, and I, I, I do think that, um, uh, you know, I think what's wrong with it, it's nothing wrong with it, I guess, in any kind of moral sense, but it's, um, it's a different expectation that I think everybody, I don't think it's an agreed upon expectation that we're just here to use each other to jack off to. Right. You know, that's that's not that's not what the dating app says. It doesn't say, "Come on this dating app and find people to jack off to." You know, like that's not what it says. It says, "Come on, match and meet the love of your life," and you know, you'll wind up in the vow section of the New York Times. But meanwhile, you know, if it said like, "Come on, match," or Tinder, and like 
have a guy jerk off to you sending him a nude of your boobs. Like if that was the explicit agreed upon contract that we all enter into when we go on this app, then okay, then maybe there would be nothing wrong with it in terms of like everybody knowing what to expect or, or not every single encounter, but what could happen, you know, but it doesn't say that. It says like, it shows like, you know, these ads, they show like big hearts and, and, and exploding hearts and, you know, love, there's going to be love involved. It doesn't say like somebody's going to be jerking off to um, choke porn and then like start talking to you and be like, do you like to be choked? You like to be choked? Because they're like jerking off to choke porn and they want to hear a real woman say to them like, yeah, baby, I love to be choked. And that gets them more excited. And I'm not saying that that's wrong in any kind of moral or sense and what i'm saying is it's not the expectation that is is expressed in either the marketing of these apps or in i would say from their own data what they explicitly know that most people want which is a relationship i mean people people might not see dating apps in that way Young women might not see dating apps in that way. I mean, the men who use dating apps might not see them in that way. But to me, I think that porn and dating apps kind of are the same. I mean, it really does turn people into these one-dimensional objects. Like you're not, you're just, you're looking at this face or this body that is totally decontextualized that you know nothing about. You're not getting any of those. Again, you wrote about this. You're not getting any of those, those signals those, I'm trying to remember what word you used, um, you know, like you're not those, those signs and those things that you actually need, not just to connect with somebody, but actually to know if you're attracted to somebody. Like there's so much subconscious you know, stuff really, that's happening in facial you know, expressions, smell, you know, like. One of the reasons why you probably reject them and don't want to use them, and I think it is a sign of good self-esteem and good mental health that you don't want to. And I, and I applaud that. I, the only point I was trying to make is like, I don't think we can judge people who, who fall into it because it is so seductive and they, they make it be seductive. And I certainly got sucked into it at a certain point, but what I'm afraid of is that people are losing very, very quickly the ability to pick up on those cues. And yeah. to know what those cues are, and to even know how to find out if somebody is trustworthy, if they are for real, all of these things that you get to know through practice. Like everything in life is practice. Yeah. Everything that you do, and the older you get, the more you realize that the stuff you're good at, it's you're good at it because you practice it a lot. Like. I think I'm a pretty good mom. And and I think that has a lot to do with, well, my own mom was a good mom in a lot of ways. I mean, in other ways, you know, she was affected by internalized misogyny like we all are and passed that on to me. But she was a very loving, nurturing mom. Plus, I just being a single parent for most of the time and having, you know, a brief marriage in between. I just had to do it a lot. I had to practice it a lot. I had to be a mom a lot to come up with ways of making my daughter's life good and, you know, like devoting myself to her and be, you know, I think it's the thing I do best in my whole life. And it's through practice. Like I didn't start out perfect, but I got like, I practiced. I found out how to have this relationship with my child because I wanted to have it be good for both of us, especially for her. So everything is practice. Like you make mistakes, you practice. You make mistakes, you practice. You do you get better and better and better at it. So that's true too of love relationships, you know? And that's true even of like dating. And if you never go on dates where you actually try and get to know somebody and figure out who they are before you bang them, and I've done plenty of that myself too. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying it doesn't lead to the same 
level of intimacy. It just doesn't. Well, no. And I mean, like the, the red flags that I notice now or the things that I think are very transparent or that I see through now with men are like totally different than what I would have noticed at 20 because I didn't, I hadn't experienced those things. I didn't know how to, you know, what was bullshit and what was like a red flag. And you know, yeah, I, you do I, learn that from experience. I young women yesterday on my summer of sexy summer or whatever hot girl summer stupid they're calling it hot girl summer story they're very young and they said to me something that it was like it just broke my heart they said this to me because i'm old and they were like um one of them was saying we're talking about dating and it's going to be this crazy summer how are we gonna? one of them said something about this guy did something bad, but in the beginning he was good. And and then he turned bad and, and everybody was like, well, they always do that. They always like start out bad and, and then they they start out good and then they turn bad because they, they start out good because they're trying to like get you into bed and then they turn bad. It's like the eternal problem, right? And so she says to me, and like, I'm just like a reporter, just like, at the, but she says to me like, cause I'm like the mom figure. She says to me, how do you know? if they're going to be one of the ones who will turn bad, how do you know? And I was like, lifetime of experience. Like, <laughs> it's like, you'll know when you know, but you just have to go through it yourself. It's like, there's nobody. Yeah. Can, unfortunately, You have to learn it. Unfortunately. Like, I don't even think, I mean, there's people like, and feminists do this all the time. They think it's like, if he's doing this or if he's doing this and if he's doing that and that might be helpful, but it's not that helpful because unfortunately, and this is really unfortunate, you do kind of have to go through it. Like I've been through bad relationships. I've been in abusive relationships and it's like now I recognize all these things and I know these things and I can see right it now. and a guy like almost instantly, it's like, ah, oh, you're a narcissist. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, I know. And or you're a phony or, you know, you're trying to sell me on something or you've got like some kind of ego problem that is actually rooted in insecurity and you're going to feel threatened by me. <laughs> well, what I, what, I, what I told her, like, it's not my really my place as a reporter to like give them advice. But what I told her was listen to this. Listen in here. If he's making you feel bad, because I can remember so many moments as a young woman when I got that feeling like it almost feels like pain. It is pain where you feel like, like, I just don't, this, I don't feel good about this. But then your internalized misogyny comes in, all the conditioning says, oh, it must be your fault. You need to do this. You need to do that. Like, it's not his fault. Like, I just told them, just listen to this. And if you feel bad, if something's making you feel bad, anything he's doing at any point is making you feel bad, get away. Like, because that's, that's, you know, you shouldn't feel that. You should feel good. Like, this person should make you feel good. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's like, a, that's a big struggle for women. It's like, okay, am I feeling anxious? Like, people, women are so self-critical and so invested in bettering themselves that it's like, oh, you know, like, I'm feeling anxiety or I'm feeling bad or I'm feeling insecure about this. This must be a problem in me that I should fix. And it's not a sign that this other person is not the right match for me, is like doing something to make me feel insecure. And I don't think that's actually bad. Like I think we should be kind of working on ourselves and being self-critical and exploring why we feel whatever ways and not just reacting emotionally. I wish I had back all the time. I wish I had back, you know, like Cher says, if I could turn back time, like you, you, I would listen to this. And I wish I had back the time and I wish I had back the money. Cause a lot of these people like have no job. And I wish I had like, I wish I had the, the, I don't know, like all kinds yeah. of, I wish I had back because I wish I had. But you didn't have wisdom. I like wish I had had like more ability to judge what was right and what was wrong based on like my own sense of it rather than like second guessing like well he must be right because you know he likes me right so this must be okay but it's not 
Yeah, but this is like the you can't you can't have that when you're 20. You can have that when you're 40 because you're confident. Like the thing that's like I love being 40. Like I'm well, I'm you're actually 40? 41. I'm 41. Wow, I thought you were like. I mean, I don't mean to be like you look so young, but you do. You look young. Thank you. I don't. I have no reason to look young. <laughs> have you ever noticed? Like, I partied more than any woman I know. <laughs> have you ever? Have you ever noticed? Okay, there's like whenever there's a hundred year old woman, they'll be like uniformly. They'll be like, "How did you get to be a hundred? How did you get to be a hundred and seven? And they'll be like, "Stay away from men." Oh. I mean, I haven't done that <laughs> at all. <laughs> I mean, I can't help myself. I just really like them a lot. I'm not joking. I really, I mean, I, I love them as friends. I like having sex with them. I like dating them. I want to be in relationships with them, despite the fact that those relationships may I not end well. If, I, if you had been interviewing me when I was 41, I would have said the exact same thing you're saying now. Yeah. So you're saying I'll change my mind someday. No, <laughs> I believe I'm you. Saying that, like, that kind of indulgence of them, despite whatever they do, kind of gets old. I believe you. After a while. Um, Especially but like, you did, which, you know, it's not for everybody and you don't have to do and to be happy, but I loved having a kid. And, and then you just kind of like, get a different view of their whole deal when they're not pulling their weight in in the raising of the kid which oh, I mean, rarely I imagine rarely do they do yeah i mean i'm not going to have a kid so and i've sort yeah. of i've avoided yeah. living with a man for some time because i found living with a man was a great way for me to hate the man that I'm living with and to destroy the relationship. I mean, we talked about that. Like, I don't know that you can be a writer and live with a man because I've had more than one experience in a relationship. Like what you talked about where it was like, I'm trying to work and write and they're like, but me, 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 me. And I'm like, I have a deadline, man. Like, it's like, I can't be touching you or paying attention to you. And also do, like, please give me some space. Like, you know, like you need space to work when you're like, I work at home. I need that space. And I feel like, you know, maybe someday I'll, we'll be able to live in, like, apartments next door to each other or something like that. But, like, mm. I would like them to work on themselves. You know, like, I, I think. Those men were big babies. So. I, like, I, you know, like, I think they need to work on themselves. I think they need to become better partners for women yeah. who want to date men. I'm, I think, you know you say that you love men and, and I guess I could say that too. I wish I didn't love them, but um, I am disappointed that the culture makes them so entitled that it makes them so unable to be treat us as equal partners, to pull their weight in the rearing of children, to um, be happy for our success, truly happy instead of competitive. I, and disappointed that, you know, it's it's fun to go out and drink and dance with men, for sure. And I've done a lot of that in my life and have sex with them. Drink, dance, have sex. It's fucking amazing. But when you have to get into the realness of life, like, and and your needs, you know, have you ever had a relationship with a man? I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm not asking, like, I'm asking for real. Have you had a relationship with a straight man? where you felt that he really met your needs sexually, emotionally, in equal parts to how you treated him? No. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but okay. I still, oh, you know, point. like, I point. have... I, 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 Match point. <laughs> I mean, I, I sort of, you know, like... <clears throat> They're handsome. I like the way they look when they catch a Frisbee. But I don't... I mean, I'm outraged. At this point, that's why I wrote this book. I am outraged at the bullshit I have put up with all these years. And okay, like I don't know, your your viewers are like people who are probably again, you know, gonna be nodding their heads with this. But if there are, viewers, have, I have very diverse. I have a very diverse audience probably, for the audience. There's you know. probably there probably are those women out there who are gonna be like, well, my man is so perfect. He's just so perfect. And girl, I'm happy for you. But we live in systemic misogyny, and and that is real. And most women don't have perfect men in their lives. Most women have to deal with a lot of bullshit. 
And it's, it's not fair. And we have I, to change things. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more likely that the men watching, like I actually have like a significant male audience for the YouTube channel, um, the, the YouTube show. So I think that they, right, well, they'll, they'll probably they feel like great. pushing back against this. All right. Well, you know, guys, don't at me. <laughs> I've had enough of your bullshit. Like, if you're perfect and you know that none of this applies to you, then just, then you won't want to at me. If you're really a good guy out there listening to me say all these things, you won't want to at me. What you'll want to do is change the men that you know who are causing these problems. You will not want to be like, I'm going to get that bitch. I'm going to tell that bitch what's real about men and how great we are. No, that won't be your reaction. If you're really a good guy, what you, the way that you'll react is, I'm listening to a woman talk about problems that are true for a lot of women, and I, I want to change my sex. I want my, the other men that I know who are like this, because you know that a lot of them are. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, a lot of them are a lot of them are insecure, needy babies who are threatened by confident, successful women. But not all of them. And I mean, I, it's like not all men, not all men. But I mean, I, I you know, like I'm talking about men who rape, men who sexual assault, men who dox, men who stalk, men who harass, men who who undermine, men who you know, like, are you really like, are you really on this podcast tonight being an apologist for men, Megan Murphy? Is that really what I'm hearing? Because I'm surprised. totally. <laughs> it's only. I mean, I like. I just. I just. I just men. men are wonderful. It's more. It's. It's <laughs> honestly. Is that what you're up to tonight, my dear? Did you just get laid or something? Uh, I mean. Because <laughs> how I always feel every time I have some good sex with a man, I'm like, I love men. Men are the best. You know, but then like when they don't uh, pay the child support or text you back or or like write some shit about you online or cyber bully you or or or, you know, I'm dealing with a situation now like I don't know, it's not a love situation. It's just something else that deals with like a patriarchal stupid thing going on. Then you're just like, really? Like, I don't know. Am I really coming on your podcast and having to be the one? who talks about men and you're just like, but they're just so cute. Is that no, right? it's that, uh, I mean, this isn't, this, this, this particular podcast isn't know. actually a feminist podcast. I mean, oh, I, I think partly. Now? Where pardon? Is, what podcast am I on? The same drugs. I'm so confused. <laughs> I mean, so part of my, my, my apologism sure from. The parents who are currently cyberbullying because. Because maybe uh, you'll find more, more, you know. I mean, I was re I was just last week. My uh, my feminist website, Feminist Current, was hacked by a misogynist who posted a bunch of like misogyny and porn on the side and I'm like so sorry. spewed I'm a bunch of. Yeah, I'm just teasing you. I'm so so sorry. About <laughs> and that. I mean, it, I am like, I That's mean, it, I I like honestly, it's like I don't want to say. It's like, I mean, I am seeing somebody right now and he's very supportive of my work. So that's sort of the part I was like, not all men are threatened by my work. He's I, I proud of me. I could tell because that's, that's how they, that's how they get us. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they lay in the public wood, then you're just like, I love men. I, I love, love men. men. <laughs> They're so wonderful. They're not so bad. Okay, okay. Anyway, so what I I, I, I do it's true, but, though. It's true. I mean, come on, let's be real. Like I've been there. I mean, I don't know how I, I mean, yeah. I'm not I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. It's like I, you know, like I said, like in all of my my love relationships with men, it's been frustrating and disappointing and I've felt like not heard and not understood and not respected. But at the same time, you know, like I have a lot of really close male friends, like male friends that I've known for like 20, 30 years or something. And I do have really good relationships with them. So I think there's different kinds of relationships that you can have with men. And, and Absolutely. I mean, my book is dedicated to a man. One of the best men that I ever knew was Donald Suggs Jr., who was the most important person in my life up until his death 
I mean, most important adult, most important adult person in my life up until his death in 2012. And he was um, my best friend and, and taught me a lot about feminism, actually. A very big feminist, gay rights advocate, wonderful journalist. I, I mean, like, are we really doing that, though? Are we really, like, are we really doing that where we're, like, we can't criticize men without having to be like, but not all men. I mean, come on. Like, are we really doing that? Like, No, I mean, we could criticize men. Um, I don't know how we can have feminism if we can't criticize men. Well, I mean, I criticize men all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, not right now. Well, I mean, all, all that I'm saying, I mean, mostly what I'm saying is that I honestly can't, like, I can't help it like I'm not like you know like I just I end up dating and in relationships with men not in it like I've never gone out looking for a relationship I've never in my life been like I want to be in a relationship I'm going to go seek out a relationship with a man I just kind of you know like I'll meet somebody and I'll like them and we'll hook up and then we'll keep hooking up and after a certain point of hooking up your it turns into a relationship like that's how my relationships happen there's not a lot of like intention there. I'm really glad that you're having a good relationship. Honest to God, I'm glad it's working out for you. And I'm well, really, really happy that you are. I, I mean, okay, but so the point that I was actually starting to make before we got into this was that I was gonna say, the reason why I love being 40 so much, or 41 in this case, is like, yeah, I, you, couldn't, you couldn't pay me to be 20 again. But it's because like when, so, you're saying, I wish I knew all these things. And I do too. Like, I wish that I'd known about these red flags. I wish that I could have, like, trusted myself. I wish I could have avoided being in all these, like, terrible relationships. I wish that I could have known not to put up with all this shit. And, yeah, like, trust your gut. But the reality is that you learn that as you age. Like, it's like you I mean, grow confident I, and you grow I wisdom. I really think that, like, you're talking about something that, you're talking about one thing and I'm talking about another thing. And I, mm. and I, and I, I validate what you're talking about, which is that we have to learn and grow as people. Of course, that's, I'm agreeing with you there. But what I feel like what happened to me is as I got older, I started to look at how the whole systems of things that are around me affected all of this. And I wasn't aware of it when I was younger. Mm. Of course, I thought I was a feminist. I thought I was a feminist. I thought I, you know, saw sexism where it happened. And, you know, I lived through a lot of things that seemed like really bad things that happened because of rape culture. But it wasn't until I really started writing, like, was on dating apps in particular, and then started writing this book and doing the film that I did a few years ago that I started to see how systemic misogyny is real in dating as well and relationships with men. And again, this is not to in any way say that I'm perfect or women are perfect or women are angels and they never do anything wrong, but just like, can't we agree upon the fact that there's, for example, systemic racism and we know that this affects the lives of people of color every single second of every single day in ways that are, challenging, oppressive, and difficult. And we know that that is the case and that we need to change that because it's not the way that anyone should have to live, you know, and that we need to look at it in ourselves and in our society. And I'm not comparing the two. I know that they are different in many ways, but also, you know, I don't have to tell you, you're a famous feminist writer and thinker, and you have a famous feminist you know, podcasts and website, there is also systemic misogyny. And it doesn't just exist in the workplace. And it doesn't just exist in 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 situations where someone's being raped. It exists in like where people are dating, like actually dating and going on dates and going on dating apps. And unfortunately, I think that it's behind dating culture right now because a lot of this culture was created by guys I mean, there are there are women who are creating dating apps, and they reach out to me sometimes, and they they're trying to change things. I don't know how possible that is based on the way the technology works and the screens and like objectification and everything, but there are women who are 
there needs to be more women in tech and there needs to be more women behind these things. And they are starting their own startups and working on these things and stuff. But I feel like in this conversation, we've gone down this road that is, you know, like kind of beneath us both to be like, Oh, but men are okay. You know, like, of course they are. We know that we know there's lots of men we both love, like fathers, well, brothers, um, friends, boyfriends, exes that I still know and love. But we, what I'm trying to talk about, write about these days is systemic misogyny as it affects dating. And no particular man should feel threatened by that if he's a good man who wants for the world to be a better place and to know that it, that this is no judgment on any one particular man or how he behaves in his own life. And no woman should be like, have to feel defensive about her husband. We, we know that we need to change things for everybody, men and women. And I don't think that, you know, it's, it's also this thing of like, I think in the past I've been drawn into this thing of like, well, I won't seem attractive if I criticize men. Men won't want me if I criticize them or something. That's just absolutely ridiculous and not true for one thing. And for another thing, like, okay, so I'll just shut up and like not be happy because I want to have sex. You know, like that's ridiculous. We have to- Yeah, well, I mean, I've never- <laughs> I've never stayed away from criticizing men. I mean, I do think, I think men behave horribly on these dating apps, and I think that these dating apps enable men to behave horribly. I think these dating apps are totally misogynist. I think they're horrible for women. I think they're really bad for men, too, just in terms of how their brain functions and that stuff we were talking earlier about, like, their ability to connect with people and focus on a person and build intimacy. Um, and, yeah, I mean, and I just... Yeah, I think that men are treating women as though they're totally disposable. And what a woman wants, what, a, what any woman wants, and I, honestly what any person should want is to feel special and to feel chosen. Like you picked me. I'm not just anybody. I'm not just like interchangeable with thousands of faces and people. And that's how dating apps treat women, and that's how men make women feel on dating apps. Well, romance has gotten a dirty it's like a dirty word now because people think that it's connected to heteronormativity in a bad way. And perhaps that's true. You know, the whole hallmark kind of debasing of romance, but I do think that um, there is a way to reimagine all of this. I think there's a way to take back serendipity and magic and romance and reimagine it and rekindle it to be something that's not tinder that's something that's truly exciting and i think that the most exciting thing that i can think of is equality in the bedroom in conversation in relationships the most exciting thing of all is equality. well respect like it's like what you want, you want somebody to actually respect you and you want to respect that person. And honestly, it's like when I, when my relationships have fallen apart, a lot of times that's happened because I've lost respect for that person because of the way that they've behaved towards me. Like, it's like, you know, if somebody disrespects you or somebody is like obviously threatened by you or somebody like, calls you a cunt or like all that. It's like, I don't respect you anymore. And I can't love somebody that I don't respect. You're not treating me with respect then, you know, like. Sometimes it's not even that blatant. Like sometimes it's just like what I hear from the people that I interview. It's not sometimes even that blatant. It's like, why didn't you text me back? What do you mean? I lost my phone. Well, well mm. I haven't heard from you in a few days. What's going on? I've talked to you last week. Totally. Oh, busy right now you know it's like it's not necessarily these days all about and and believe me like plenty of abuse real serious abuse goes on and that's got to stop but there's a different kind of abuse now that i hear a lot about which is this kind of like uh diminishment of your importance to me yeah you know it's like this contest to see who can care less 
It's like, you don't own me. Like what I have to talk to you all the time. What? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, also, communicate. there's also a problem of, of also I hear about guys who just want more, more time than, than, than they're entitled to. Like they just want to like be all, like constantly on your phone. My friend calls it a device wife, you know, and like, um, but it's just, I think what you said about special wanting to feel special and that really is what romance is all about making another person feel really really special and that's really really hard to do when there's seemingly millions and millions of options and right when somebody is just you know like the there's even words for it in dating culture now like the, you know side hoe and and all these things that indicate that someone is not the main event. They're like the back burner person. And there's like always like a, a, a second team and all, you know, I mean, this is not the way that we're going to, this is not the way we should be treating each other. And this is not the way that we will ultimately find happiness. It's just not. And it's not because I'm, I know everything. It's because it's kind of obvious and it is borne out in studies that we become happy -er and less lonely and more fulfilled in our lives when we have lasting, we build lasting relationships with people. And that doesn't mean that, like, I know there are people also who are polyamorous and that's, that's a valid choice too. But it's not like even people in polyamory have relationships that last over time, you know? Like they might have more than one, but what all studies bear is that even if you have more than one, you're going to get your happiness, your sense of like safety, your sense of your sense of um, well-being from knowing that there are people in your life who are, you're close to that you can trust. And I think that we're at a very challenging time for that right now, whether it's men, women, or people who are other than that yeah and people need to be reminded of that so I'm glad that you said that because I think that people have been told by you know these these corporations by our culture by pornography that you know like you actually you don't need that kind of intimacy like you can be fulfilled just by like compartmentalizing um tell us we don't need anything but them Corporations tell us we don't need anything but them. Dating apps are really designed to have you have a relationship with an app and not with a person. Yeah. And I think that's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Not, I mean, not just like end of families and marriage and all that kind of, you know, heteronormative stuff, but the end of like happiness, you know, sex robots are on the horizon. Yeah. So, okay, so let's finish by, you know, what do you suggest? You know, what are you telling people to do to kind of combat the direction that we're headed? Um, please don't cyber bully me. Please don't. <laughs> nobody will cyber, nobody that watches this show will cyber bully you. Please don't cyber bully me. No. I come in peace. I want people to have love and, and happiness and connection with whomever they want, but to focus on somebody and to make that person feel respected, whoever they are. I want people to, to be connected to each other because that is how we have a civilization that works. And that is how we have uh, a civilization that has um, hu hu a humanity to it. You know, if we have a civilization, if we have a, a, a culture in which everybody's disposable, nobody matters, everybody is to be treated as an object, we we don't have much of a culture at all. So I don't know. I don't think that these, I don't think that these technologies, these corporations who run these technologies, are interested in seeing us do that because they just want our time, our money, and our data. And um, I just want people to treat each other with respect. That's all. Yeah. Because I think that's how we not only have a a humanistic society that, you know, works, but also that's how we find happiness. 
through love, actual, you know, try and love each other. You know, that sounds so naive, but that really is the answer to everything is that we have to try and love each other. And if you look at all the hate that is propagated on these platforms, how can you say that this is working? Yeah, totally. Um, I agree with you. Um, thanks so much for talking with me today. I actually, honestly, like, I feel like, I don't know. It's not, I don't actually think that we were super disagreeing with each other. I think that we were talking past each other a little bit, but also I think that like some conflict is like interesting or disagreement is interesting. It's, it's impossible I it was for me conflict. to have a conversation with anyone without conflict. I do not know why my, I don't know why. I don't know why my, my, but it's kind of exciting or something. I don't know. Totally. Like, no, I like it. And I think it's, I don't mean to do it. I don't mean to do it. But like my friend Amy says to me, you're like that. <laughs> you're like that, you know, that Eminem song. My name is my name yeah. is my name. Yeah. is. Yeah. And he says, God sent." I, what does he say? I don't know the exact line. Don't like laugh at me if I get it wrong. God sent me here to piss people off. She said, that's how I am. Like, it's just like, I don't even have to say anything and people get pissed off. Megan. I don't know. <laughs> they get pissed off. But if you just please try and think about like what I'm actually saying, I'm just trying to stick up for people. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I don't think you're saying Including anything myself. offensive. I, and I also did want to add before we end that I was very excited when you mentioned um, fucking run because in high school, uh, like I know, I still know all the words to that song. But in high school, we would like walk home from house parties, like singing that song. Like I woke up alone, and then and I was thinking about it actually when I was reading your book because I was like, I don't want you to get like a licensing problem. But oh right, oh I never even think of that. But it was funny because her the the chorus where it's like I want a boyfriend, the kind of guy who makes love when he's in it. I want a boyfriend. Um, that whole. That whole album the whole I was like oh I guess this is an old problem it's much worse now but I was like it is worse now it is it actually the kind is. of guy who tries to win me over and whatever happened to a boyfriend <laughs> the whole sound of that whole album is so um edgy it's still so edgy and cool so good yeah. and so good and you know she said things like just how we were feeling them at the time oh, oh by the way man. i have it's a spotify a playlist for this book oh cool okay it's nothing it's called nothing personal and it's like i don't know i never did that before but i, I was like you know I, I like i just there's a lot of songs referenced in the book like that song and there's other songs and i just like started putting them on this playlist and then other songs that like I don't know, songs that like I danced to or made out to or like had sex to or like I had a breakup to, like to the left, to the left. That's breaking up with my second husband. Like, you know, I literally, we literally played that song. My friend Allison is also in my book because she sadly killed herself. See, this is why I don't like, you know, take these things too lightly because I've seen the harm that comes to people through this stuff. And, and, and girls, being so sad in their lives and, and being cyber bullied and having terrible things happen to them and my friend killing herself, not because of just men, but because of the whole thing. She was a, a, a woman of color in New York City in, in, in a time when it's like almost impossible to, you know, very lonely. And, and, and a lot of men that she dealt with were not so nice. And, and I'm not saying like men killed my friend, she had to deal with racism. She had to deal with systemic misogyny. She had to deal with a whole bunch of stuff. But like, you know, I don't look at her death as just like, oh, you know, she couldn't handle things. She was weak. She, you know, I, I can't look at thing. I can't look at people like that anymore. Cause I can see it can kill people. Like this stuff can kill people. You know, we're not talking about just like dating is not a trivial thing. It's not a trivial subject. It's not just like, oh, you know, he wouldn't text me back. It's like it can it can kill you the way, especially over time to be treated badly. You know, and I, I just I kind of want people to be nicer to each other. 
Absolutely. I mean, I just, I mean, I want people to consider other people's feelings. I mean, I think people are sold, like, I mean, we should end this soon, but like, you know, people are basically sold selfishness and individualism to the extreme. And it's like, you come first, you come first, you come first. And, you know, like, you should put yourself first in some scenarios, but God, you also have to have, I mean, what is, what is the world and what is life without people and your relationships and love and connection is nothing. There's no, you can't just be you. Like, it's not just you, it's everything else. And yeah, you need to consider how you're treating people and, and make an effort to treat people with respect, regardless of, you know, whether or not you feel like it. <laughs> Like, don't be so lazy with other people's feelings and lives. And if you wind up alone, like me, it's not so bad. Like, it's kind of cool. Being to single can be really fun. Yeah. It can. I, love it. I actually, I actually really love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I was single during all of COVID and a bit before that, and I was really miserable and really depressed and really anxious. And then I ran away to Mexico. And as soon as I got here, I was happy. I mean, partly that was just because I, I was around people and meeting men and socializing and hooking up or whatever, but pardon? Do you speak Spanish? No, and it's, it's tough. And I really like Spanish and I'm sort of half trying, but it's, and they're really not picking it up very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you're so brave to move to a country where you don't speak the language like that's I mean, so a lot of people here speak english so it's 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 easy to be but it does suck like it is it does make some things are you learning are sure. you taking classes or something? i am taking classes it's just it's very hard to learn a new i just thought i'd pick it up a lot quicker than i am <laughs> really not it's are not you there are you gonna stay there yeah yeah I've, i'm can i say something like i yeah. like i totally you know please forgive me for saying so but and i know last time we talked like it was in the throes of pandemic and everything but you seem so much happier yeah i'm really happy i'm super i've never been happier in my entire life i'm not even exaggerating oh, you're just like you're like literally glowing oh thank you, you seem, that's very nice you seem so good and i'm so glad I, yeah, I really, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I've never had so much fun or been so happy ever, ever in my life. Like, yeah. which I would not have expected in my forties. And I just keep telling people who are younger than me. I'm like, man, just wait until you turn 40. <laughs> like, you yeah, think you're having fun now? Nah. You don't want to make the mistake too. This is what I'm trying to tell you of thinking like, I made all the right choices. So now I'm better than everybody else because I made up, you know, there's like, I'm so happy for you, but sometimes happiness can reduce the compassion. And mm. I, actually, I've done that. I've, I've been there too. I've been there too. Done that too. Where like, it's at a high point, you know, like I remember when I first married my second husband, Oh my God. I was like, I am in the promised land. Like I finally found this man and it's just so perfect and everything's so wonderful. And like, everything's always just going to be this way forever and ever. I read about, there's a paragraph in the book where I say that, where I would just like, like drive along in my car. And I remember Alicia Keys came on like, no one, no one. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I just like, everything's just so good. Cause I got this man and it's just so wonderful. Well, guess what? Uh, that lasted for a while and then it didn't pan out. Oh, yeah. And like, but my happiness predates seeing okay. this person, which okay. is not right. like, you know, like. Well, I'm, I'm so glad that it does because that is exactly what I was going to say. You got to make yourself happy regardless of the guy. And I'm so yeah. glad you're doing that. That's well, what I was trying to sell to people was that, you know, like, so I got here in January and I was single and, uh, and um, I was just having so much fun. I was so excited to be single and I was just, you know, like it's really freeing and really liberating. And uh, I think some people are fearful of being single, but it can be like so awesome. But also like, again, there are some people who say like, if you just focus on yourself and just make everything about you, then the right man will come along. Well, okay, yeah, maybe, okay, that's cool. And if that happens for you, I'm happy for you. But the other thing is like, that doesn't fix systemic misogyny. 
<laughs> you know, that doesn't mean like everything, just because you're like in a good period in your life, whoever you are, and you're feeling good, that doesn't mean like all the problems that like other women and other like other people are having because of this system that we live in that needs to be changed are wrong and like doing it wrong or something. Like I'm just saying like, things go in waves. We need to work on changing the system overall, no matter how we're feeling about that particular time in our life, good, bad, whatever. And I wish I had spent more time on that my whole life, making things better Be because overall, because it's not really about like any certain moment in which you feel good or bad. It's like the whole thing has got to change the whole thing. And that starts with paying women more and, you know, like it's all interconnected. And that's what I started to see is the, the inter interconnection of it all, you know? Yeah. But um, I'm glad you I'll let you go. Huh? I'm glad you're having a good time. Ago. You sure look like you're having a good time. That's fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, it was a it was a really good decision that I made to run away in Mexico. <laughs> well, I think getting out of like these northern countries is like getting out of America is something. Just having really different cool. perspectives and meeting new people and making new friends. Like it's really like and you know, I've was I lived in Vancouver my whole life and I was already kind of done with it. You know, Vancouver is pretty insular. It's a lot of the same kind of people, it's a lot of the same kinds of opinion. And it's nice to be around different people and diverse people and people from all around the world. And, you know, cause people come here from all sorts of places and the culture is different. And anyway, I could go on, but visit me? pardon. Are you still going to come visit me? I hope you do. Oh, of course. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll be back and forth to the States all the time for work and stuff. I mean, we have events coming up, not in New York yet, but I'm sure there'll be another one. And we definitely have to go for, drinks when I'm there. So I'm sure I'm sure I'll be in New York sometime like, you know, soon this year, next year or something like that. So we'll be in touch. Thanks. I'm sorry. I took up like over two hours of your time. So I really appreciate it. Thank oh, you so much. You. I really enjoyed your book. And I hope that lots of Maybe people buy you. your book. Oh, thank you for doing that. I want to come see you. And I, that's, that's the galley. Well, come the, visit the, me the, here, the, dude. The real, um, the real, hard copy has like this pretty red stem and you can you can find out how to buy it at um my website nancyjosales.com cool i'll link to it down below and send me the the spotify playlist and i'll link to it down in the show notes also okay. um i want to visit you in mexico oh my you totally should it's so fun here it's like the most fun town ever and I'm not exaggerating you. i'm really gonna come no, come visit. It would be so fun. I'm not, no, really come. I'm you would really love it. You would come. have so much fun. You should I come. I'm, not, I'm being serious. <laughs> like, I'm come and visit. I want people to come visit. Okay. I'm going to okay. do it. I'm going to show I, up. You have no, place. do it. I'll send you, I'll send you. I don't want to say on like on the video where it is, but I'll send you, no, no, no. I'll send you, you the. Do me to sleep or do I have to like do an Airbnb and all that crap? Um, well, my, yeah, an Airbnb, I, my, I'm sort of in like a one room kind of place here. Wow. There's not, there's not right. actually even a bedroom for me. And, and you're where you are. It can't be that bad, right? Can't be that expensive. There's lots of Airbnbs here. It's easy. I'll send you some info. Okay. Okay. Bye. Good to talk to you.